Well, welcome and good evening, wonderful dice of all alignments. I am Lunar D8. Greetings, one and all, to the most cursed, most cringiest corner of the internet. A YouTube channel content creator actively alienating everyone in both the analog and digital world. This is Let's Play. It gets so lonely here. The aesthetic I see of this so far kind of makes me think of other games. Looking up, I see only a ceiling. Milk inside of a bag of milk inside of a bag of milk. Milk outside of a bag of milk outside of a bag of milk. Hazy mind. Reflexia. Saturine. You are running through a forest. It is late. At night, and the sky is as black as pitch. There is nothing to light your way, save for the moon's milky glow, but its rays cannot reach you. Not properly. The trees which surround you, jutting out of the earth like eerie monuments to a foreign god, are blotting out most of the light. You cannot see where you are going. <clears throat> Even if you had commenced your flight at a more sensible hour, however, with the light of the sun to aid you, it would be of little use. You do not know where you are going. You have no map, no route, 
No plan. Do you guys say do you guys say route or route? I say route. You are running like a frightened animal, anxious and nervy, with no destination in mind. You have no desire as you run, save to escape. You cannot let yourself be caught. If that were to happen, you are certain that you would be ruined. You have no choice, therefore, but to keep going. <coughs> on and on, though your feet are screaming at you for mercy. You have no idea how long you have been running. Time has begun to blend together. It has lost all meaning. Something sharp snags at the hem of your skirt. But you do not have the luxury to pause and examine what has happened. <coughs> Instead, you tug. Your skirt tears and the sound splitting through the forest. <coughs> <coughs> and you stumble forwards with a shocked gasp. You are free, but at what cost your skirt has been irrevocably damaged. It might be too late to worry about such trivial matters now, though. If you do not start running again, and soon she will catch you. Then your life will be over. You do not know if she is still following you, but you do not want to risk looking over your shoulder. If you are to see her, silhouetted beneath a tree, looking at you with that sticky, sickly, sweet smile which once ensnared you you would lose what little nerve you possess your legs would lock up your legs would lock up and your blood would freeze in your veins then you would crumple you would fall but you would not hit the ground she would be there to catch you did she not promise when you made that contract that you would never be alone you would like to take back that silly wish of yours but it is too late for that. It is too late for a lot of things. All you can do is run. You run and run and run. <clears throat> While icy fog swirls about your feet. It is cold enough to sap the heat from your body, and you shudder from it. It feels as though you are drowning. It feels as though you are being buried alive. Your knees and your shins, meanwhile, are bleeding. You cannot endure much more of this, but if you value your own life, you must. You run, and you run, and you run, and until at long last, you reach a fork in the road. There are three paths which split off from the forest, well four if you count the path which you came. You cannot exactly double back on yourself though, not when you have put so much effort into running forwards. You can only press on. The three paths are signposts, which is something of a strange sight, given you are so deep in the forest. Dark though it may be, you have grown accustomed to the shadows. You can just about pick out the writing on this old dilapidated signpost, curved and slanted though it is. Your fate, if you will forgive me for sounding cliché, is in your own hands. Now I wonder, which path will you take? Go to the castle. 
So you want to go to the castle? Good idea. All decent fairy tales tend to conclude in castles once they're beleaguered, beleaguered, put upon heroines are finally able to wed the handsome princes they once dreamed of. Why bother trying your luck with the shore, which may very well be deserted, or the village, which may be full of dirty, barefoot peasants? It is far better to skip the suffering and go straight to the grand finale. That is very astute of you. I did not realize you had it in you to be so mercenary. I can only wonder what you will uncover during your moonlight meanderings. The night is far from over and your adventures are only just beginning. I hope only that you have brushed up on your curtsies. They might come in handy when one is interacting with a sovereign. Royals can be temperamental after all. If you fail to treat them with the prerequisite amount of respect, you might come to regret it. You follow the path which leads to the castle, supporting yourself on weary, aching legs which feel ready <coughs> at a moment's notice to detach from your hips. You are little more than a wisp of a girl, but you have been running for so very long, and your feet are so very numb. You feel like a great lumbering thing, clumsy and ungainly. The soles of your feet are screaming at you. You need to lie down and quickly. Your only hope as you continue to run that you will find a spare room available for you in the castle. You do not know what exactly will await you at the castle, but you have visions as you run of a vast opulent dwelling. This dwelling will surely be full of finely furnished rooms in which you might rest your weary head. There might also be a king and queen inside this castle. You ponder who will be kind and wise, and what of their children? What of a princess? Every good castle must possess a princess who will take the pity on you and your plight. You can imagine the face of this generous princess of ease, thanks to the fairy tales you read in abundance as a small child. The princess will be fair of hair and blue of eye, with soft pink lips pursed like rosebuds. Her limbs will be slender, her hands dainty, and unsullied from physical labor, and her sensibilities will be sweeter than marzipan. She will be kind to you and compassionate, just like an older sister. You do not know what older sisters are like, though, or younger sisters for that matter. You are only guessing. You are not a complete fool, however, despite your tendency to daydream, and you do have a few reservations. Monarchs do not, as you know from voracious reading, have the best track record when it comes to caring for the peasantry. Was there not a very famous queen who once said, with a cavalier wave of her hand, that the hungry peasants in her kingdom should content themselves with cake if bread was not an option? That was Marie Antoinette, wasn't it? That was the whole thing with France before there was a French Revolution where everyone was starving. And and it was it was less of a... Granted, it definitely showed that she really didn't give a fucking shit about the people. But the big thing that wasn't that, it was the fact that it really showed a complete disconnect that... She really did not understand what life was for the average person, that she was so... Like, her way of living and what she was around on a day-to-day -day basis, she had no idea what the real world was actually like. <clears throat> you think that this might be a misquote, but the point still stands. Though royals are supposed to grant their subjects succor in their time of need. This does not always happen. In fact, it very rarely happens. Kings and queens and princesses and princes are just people. At the end of the day, and they are subject to the same caprices that all humans are. They can also be careless and selfish and inconsiderate. There is no guarantee that this mythical princess of your imagination will help you. Why, there is no guarantee that this mythical princess exists at all. Still, you must try. It is the hope which keeps you going. You continue to run to the castle. It takes some time before you finally emerge from the woods, but finally, you do it.
How much time, you ask? I cannot answer that, did I not say? The time had begun to lose all its meaning. The forest is behind you now. At least, and all that awful nightmares which dwelt within. It is still cold, though, and foggy and very, very dark. The sun is yet to rise. You can see the moon more clearly now. Though as it hangs above your head, round as any pearl or orb or crystal ball, the moonlight shines down upon the castle which looms in front of you like a cliffside. The stone edifice of the building is imposing, and it drowns you in shadows darker than the depths of the deepest ocean. The castle is not all dark, though, not like the night sky above it. When you crane your head, you can see that there are lights flickering within, in the narrow, slitted windows. It would appear that somebody is home. The king and queen, perhaps? What of their servants? What, perhaps more pressingly, of their guards? You have expected as you stand there that armor knights will cost you for daring to approach the castle of king and queen so-and-so. Do you not know your place, foolish peasant girl, with the dirty skirt? Be gone with you. You are not, of course, a peasant. Your family is a wealthy one, or rather, they were, before your father made a series of poor financial decisions. You do not look like a young lady right now, though, with your dirty face and your dirty skin, which is torn at the hem. If any guards were to take you for a vagrant, it would not be surprising. But though you stand there dithering, your filthy fingers hooked in the front of your filthy skirt, you do not hear any cries. Nobody sounds the alarm. Lights might be on the inside of the castle, but there is nobody outside of its perimeter standing sentry. There is nobody to impede your entry, and the elaborate iron gates which are set into the vast stone walls of the castle exterior are open, just a crack. It would be a trivial matter to slip inside. There is nobody to stop you. Why are you trembling now, you silly thing? You have come so very far, and it would be an act of foolishness to turn around now. Go on. Go. You inhale, perhaps in an attempt to screw up your courage, which has at long last begun to fail you. And then you step forwards. You slide between the wrought iron gates as stealthily and as secretive as a thief, and then cross the path which leads up to the tall, imposing structure. The domed doorway which leads into the castle itself, hewn from stone, is closed, but at a push of your palm it swings inward. The door creaks alarmingly. As it opens, the sound, loud enough to split the silence like a thunderclap. You inhale at this and glance around, your eyes diding hither and thither. If there are any guards posted about the castle's grounds, they should have been alerted by that sound. <clears throat> will they come for you? At long last? What will happen should they catch you? Will they throw you in the dungeons? That does not sound like a pleasant way to spend a night. At least you would have a roof over your head, though, and you would not have to keep walking. Your feet really do ache. You stand there for an indeterminable amount of time, your heart pounding a panicked, irregular rhythm in the base of your throat. But no matter how much time elapses, no guards come. You are thankful for your good luck, though it does make you wonder, where is everybody? Why? Is It is almost as if all the people in the world have disappeared. Could you be the very last human left alive? You frown and press your palm back against the door. You push less cautiously this time, heedless of the loud sound which splits the silence. There is no point in worrying about guards, not when they might very well be non-existent. Your entry to the castle secured. You then take a step forwards. Anyone else getting a liminal spaces sort of vibe? Like the back room sort of thing? Or is it just me?
The door swings shut behind you and the resultant slam makes you jump. You did not expect it. Your heart knocks against your ribs, and with wild eyes you glance about. You are standing in a vast entrance hall made of stone which splits off into a number of passages. At the very end of the hall, meanwhile, there is a large elaborate staircase, one which seems to extend to the heavens themselves. It is dark inside the hall, but there are numerous torches set in sconces. Or is it sconces? Sconces or sconces? I would say sconces in the stone wall, which are aflame. They offer some relief from the shadows. You can hear the faint sound of the wind outdoors as it moans against the castle's impervious walls, but you cannot hear any footsteps. You cannot hear any voices. You cannot, more importantly, hear any people. Maybe the castle was empty. If that is the case, though, then who lit these torches? It is a curious conundrum. You muster up what remains of your courage, then cry out, addressing the empty hall in a timorous voice, which fails to properly fill up the space. Hello, you say, your eyes wide open. Is anybody there? Your voice echoes through the vast empty halls, but it is met yet again with silence. You cannot say you are too surprised. But it is somewhat disappointing. Not one to be deterred, you try again and again, your voice growing louder with each subsequent attempt. No matter how loud your voice, however, it fails to reach any ears. If anybody is here, they do not seem to be particularly sociable. That, or perhaps they simply cannot hear you. Hearing aids have not been invented yet. Could they be in another room? Yes, that must be it. You will never find that pretty fairy tale princess of yours. Imagination if you stand idle, you know. It is time to get to work. Put those legs of yours to good use. Not knowing what else to do, is there anything else you can do? You begin to explore. <coughs> you examine the rooms first on the ground floor of the castle, which are of similar scale to the impressive entrance hall, large and richly furnished, but utterly unoccupied. After some time of aimless meandering, encountering nobody save the ghosts of Aeon's past, memorialized on portraits upon the wall, you muster the courage to ascend to the second floor. This floor, too, you examine, wandering through a seemingly endless series of hallways, until at long last you find a door which is ajar. From between the crack in the door and the jam, you can see flickering light. Irregular, yes, but it is light nonetheless. Could it be from a fireplace? That would suggest, then, that this room is occupied, unlike all the others. Perhaps the kindly princess you dreamed of will be awaiting you in this room. It is with a trembling hand that you press your palm against the door. You push it. Then you step inside the bedchamber, which unveils itself to you. Shyly, you stand in the threshold of the chamber, much of your courage extinguished and gasp. The bedroom itself is gorgeous. It is a chamber so luxuriant, not even the shadows can obscure the fine craft of the furniture within it, nor the rich patterns on the wall. It is the girl inhabiting the chamber, however, who truly takes your breath away. Sitting upon the velveteen sheets of the towering four-posters, this girl in a sumptuous red gown, 
who seems to be of a like age to you. You do not have a clear view of the girl's face. Her head is bowed, her gaze directed downwards at her lap. You can tell from her hair, however, and from her slender calves, which protrude from beneath the hem of her dress, that she is very pretty. Anyone else get the impression I mean one, it's not a bad looking outfit. But I would say the black part is something you would not really ever hardly see. It's a nice combination of colors in my opinion, but it's I th something I think would be a bit rare to encounter. But is it just me, or does it look like the way the white parts of the fabric are arranged? Almost like their teeth, like of the mouth of a shark? Almost like the um, earrings are also like shark teeth? Heck, the, the rest of the... But, yeah. yeah even looking at the crown. <laughs> the girl's hair is golden, just like freshly cut wheat. <coughs> but it's the red of her dress which truly captures your attention. She is so striking you cannot look away from her. The girl is not alone in her chamber, either. She has a companion, though. This companion is not so... not half so endearing as she. In her lap, perched upon her velvet skirt, is a doll. The doll's hair, like that of her mistress, is as golden, though much of it is hidden beneath a bonnet. The girl is adjusting the china teacup held in the doll's tiny hand, while the rim of the cup glints in the light which exudes from the fireplace. If the girl is of a similar age to you, it seems that she would content herself by playing with dolls. Is she not too old for it? The girl would be more at home, you decide, at a ball, wearing an extravagant gown, speaking with wealthy noblemen, perhaps even princesses. I would say... I wouldn't say it's so much an issue of a maturity thing, is that one, some people do have certain interests and hobbies, like, I don't know, Sonic the Hedgehog? But when it comes to having like stuffed animals and stuff, it's usually people that are more isolated and introverted. Oh well. She should not be sitting in what you presume to be as her bedchamber, adjusting a teacup in a doll's hand. But you are not afforded much more time to stand there marveling at the girl because she turns. She raises her head. Well, at least I don't have to worry about, like, giving you a heart attack by making a loud noise to get your attention. But hi. Then her eyes meet yours. You thought the girl pretty when you first observed her, sitting on the edge of her plush velveteen bed, examining her doll. Now she is looking, however, her face illuminated by the flames in their grate, and you can see that you were mistaken. She is not just pretty. She is beautiful. So much so, it is breathtaking. She looks as though she has stepped out of the pages of a picture book. She is simply too perfect to belong in this world. Perhaps she is some kind of vision, a waking dream, an hallucination. But no, she is none of those things. The doll in her lap is cold, a hard thing made of porcelain, and is unflinchingly, reassuringly real. If she were a mirage, surely she would not be able to handle physical objects such as this. It is strange, though. The doll, though immaculately made, looks oddly imperfect when compared to the girl who is holding it. 
She is so startlingly beautiful. She even puts man-made representations of feminine charms to shame. The sight of her makes you feel rather weak. You always have had a fondness for fair maidens, haven't you? You are rather hopeless when it comes to them, even worse than a knight errant from a courtly legend. Your ascetic appreciation is not particularly ladylike, but, well, it is not every day a girl encounters an elegant beauty like this, attired in red, illuminated by the firelight. I suppose I can forgive you for this rudeness, as too can the girl. She does not seem to be the type to hold a grudge. Oh, the girl says in a voice that's surprisingly enough, far less refined than her appearance. It is good to see you. I've been waiting. Has she? That is news to you. You blink perplexed a response on the tip of your tongue, but you are unable to expel it to the other. And you are unable to expel it into the ether. <coughs> the girl is settling, setting her doll aside. Then she stands, the hem of her dress swinging about her legs. Nimbly, like a ballerina, she canvases the space between you. Her room is so very large that there is quite a lot of space. Then takes your hands in her own. You must, the girl says. Her eyes glow with excitement. Be my new lady's maid. It's been a while, but it's such a relief that you finally arrived. I knew that you would. You'd never leave me alone. Not when you knew how long I was waiting. Oh, I'm so happy. The girl's good mood is contagious, so much so you find yourself being swept away in it. You are tempted to accept any identity she might press upon you. You have never been a maid before, but you might not mind being the girl's maid. She does not seem like a poor mistress to serve, not if she is always this kind. You cannot mask the confusion, however, which flickers across your face. You are not a good enough actress, and in any case, this is all happening too quickly. Why, you barely know this girl. Why is she being so very familiar? It is with a blank, bovine eyes that you examine the girl. Your befuddlement is pronounced enough that even the girl, despite her good mood, notices it. She frowns. Then she says, her fingers sliding away from your own. Or am I mistaken? Are you not my new ladies, maid after all? The disappointment in the girl's face is abundant. So much so, your heart clenches. You do not know her. She is still a stranger. But you are struck, all of a sudden with an utter desire to appease her. You do not want to let her down. The thought is devastating. You were not aware, you tell her, that you had applied to be her maid. But if that is what she wills, you would not be opposed to it. You pray that she forgives you, though, for your discombobulation. You come from a distant country, and you have traveled for many miles. You know not where you are, and you do not know who she is. What? You don't know who I am? It is regrettable, you tell her, but no, you do not know her, though that is no fault of her own. Why, you have spent such a long time running, you hardly even know yourself. Ah, so you are a fugitive, then, from another country, I see. I won't pry into your past, then, if you'd rather forget about it. I don't mind sharing my past with you, though. Everybody in this country knows who I am. After all, or at least, they should. Now this is quite the impressive boast. If it were to come from the lips of another, you would find it unpleasantly arrogant. You do not think, however, that this girl is trying to show off. You get the feeling instead that she is merely telling the truth. If you do not, if you don't have the pleasure of knowing me, then allow me to do the honors. My father and my mother were the king and queen of this realm, and I am its princess. I've lived in this castle all my life, 
so I don't know much about the outside world, but I know that there are other countries do exist out there. I presume it is from one of these foreign countries that you come from. It is very good to meet you. I've always wanted to talk to somebody from overseas. It feels like quite the opportunity, he. The girl giggles at this, and you smile in response. You tell her unthinkingly that it is your pleasure, really, to meet her, or at least you mean to. You only get halfway through this remark when the full gravity of what the girl has told you sinks in. You come to a stop, then you stare. Did she just say she was a princess? Yes, that's right, I'm a princess, and one day I'll be queen after I've done a little bit of growing up. My ministers don't think I'm ready to run the country by just yet, but I've been doing my best at my lessons. One day I'm sure I'll be the best queen there ever was. So she really is a princess. That makes sense, you suppose, given she lives in a castle, but it comes as a surprise regardless. You hadn't known before you entered the chamber that you were trespassing on a lady of such great renown. Why, if she willed it, she could have you executed for your carelessness. An ugly red flush creeps up in your face, a flush which is far more lurid than the princess's dress, as you look at your feet. Bashfully, you stammer out a new address that you are very sorry for intruding upon her, and you hope that she can forgive you. <coughs> oh, it's all right. Think nothing of it. I don't mind, really. We all make mistakes, and anyway, you weren't to know. You said you weren't from around here. You nod your head in silent affirmation. It isn't a complete lie. You really are not from this country. You are not from this world at all. How wonderful. I'll look forward to picking your brain later. All of my servants come from the nearby village. Their tales are all the same, and so are their superstitions. I could do with a breath of fresh air. My last lady's maid told me I was too impetuous. But I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting a bit of adventure. Not that I've ever been afforded much of that. I've been shut up in here for so long. I hardly ever get the chance to talk to other girls my age. My last lady's maze was older than me, and so was the one before her and the one before her. Some of the princess's fair mood seems to dissipate as she speaks, her expression turning by degrees into something rather more pensive. But I haven't seen any of my old lady's maids in a while, or any of the other servants for that matter. They've all disappeared. Now that is quite curious. How could a whole household full of servants simply disappear? That I don't know. This castle was full of servants once. My lady's maids, and my undermaids, and my scullery maids, and my housekeeper, and my cooks, and a large retinue of retainers. By the way, it would suck to be a scullery maid. Basically, you're the person, like, peeling potatoes and shit. Basically, the very, very menial tasks, even by maids' standards of back then. They're all gone now, though. I think my ministers must have sent them away. I don't know why they would have done that, though. They didn't explain it to me. But then again, they never explained anything to me. They still treat me like a little girl. It is so tiring. She said that her ministers sent her servants away. What of her parents, the king and queen? Would they not be the ultimate authorities in the castle's hierarchy? They're probably dead. They would, yes, if they were still alive. But they're not. They died a long time ago. I was raised for most of my life by my servants. That sounds super fucking depressing. Because, I mean, regardless how rich a person is... You would still want parents and loving parents at that. Heck, I mean, I've said it before about the current divorce issues in this society. Yes, it's terrible for parents to stay together if they're people that are abusive and toxic toward each other. It would make for a terrible environment for a child. But at the end of the day, the fact that almost all the marriages are ending in divorce... You have all these children growing up in broken homes. 
or living in dysfunctional families. It's a shame that such a thing that should be rare is so common. Oh, you answer, and then you flush. You hadn't known. It's all right. You don't need to apologize. I'm just happy that I have you now. I mean, I wouldn't try to give her a hug, but if she gave me a hug, I would not be opposed. I was getting sick and tired of only having my dolls to speak to. They aren't the best conversational partners. And that's the other thing. Usually if somebody does talk to dolls or stuffed animals quite a bit, it usually is somebody that's lonely and has a lack of other people to talk to. That being said, it does come in handy to sometimes pace your living room or go for walks and have mock debates with yourself. Sometimes imagining what people from the past would say about certain arguments that you have. Basically, it's a good idea to have discussions with yourself where you actually try to win a debate with yourself from both sides of an argument. It lets you have better self-introspection and reflection. Understand yourself better and your own, you know, your own way of looking at the world. And it lets you understand better how to... And heck, you can build up your own confidence when it comes to talking to people. So if you're somebody who is a bit less sociable or a bit social anxiety, it can help you to be better at talking to people. You can imagine so, yes. You doubt any doll, even one made by a talented artisan with an intelligent face indistinguishable from a human would be very good at answering back. Oh no, they aren't. They're hopeless at it, really. They're so stony-lipped. You have no idea how much of a relief it is to see you. This castle is so big, and without my servants, it feels so very empty. It gets so lonely here. Now that is an interesting turn of phrase. It catches inside your heart like a burr. Have you heard it before? You do not have much time to ponder this, however, because the princess is speaking anew, in that curiously conversational manner of which hers, which does not seem particularly princessy. Maybe she learned how to speak from her servants, or maybe it's a manner of speaking that comes from talking to yourself all the time. That would explain why her, cons her consonants are so unrefined. Oh, but listen to me yammering on again. It's a bad habit. I really must put a stop to it. You are probably tired, dear one, from your travels. Would you like me to show you to your room? Yes, the princess announces before you can say anything and reply. I think I'll do just that. I might show you a bit around the castle first, though. It's like a maze in here, and I wouldn't want you getting lost. You might need to like, put like signs up like it's a fucking mall. You'll be staying here for quite some time, after all. The princess then hastens to take you on a tour of her home. Fortunately, she does not show you all of the rooms in her abode. And neither does she offer overly long descriptions as to what the few rooms she does show you are used for. She does, however, pause by the kitchens where she offers you some victuals. Once the growling in your belly is satisfied, the princess then resumes her journey. She leads you down a dark, twisting hallway and up a series of equally dark, twisting steps until she arrives at long last before a door. The princess pushes this door aside summarily, thus permitting you to entrance to a small, humble bedchamber. This chamber is not half so opulent as the grand bedroom in which the princess resides, with its resplendent four poster and its richly patterned wallpaper. This room's ceiling is not as high, and the singular bed shoved against the wall is thin and narrow. The walls are an unassumingly beige, and the floor beneath your shoes is of warped wood. There is a malodorous scent, too, which hangs in the air, one of disuse and general decay. You get the feeling that nobody has slept in this room for quite some time. 
That might explain why it feels so very cold in here. Though if the princess's tour of her castle has taught you anything, it is that it is cold in every room in her abode. Now here we are, the final stop of our tour. This will be your room, dear one. I hope you find it to your liking. The princess then, despite her exalted status, looks somewhat uneasy as she observes you, her eyes upturned like those of a loyal dog's. Is she concerned about your reactions to this room? Perhaps she was, is afraid you will turn your nose up at her kindness. For a princess, she is awfully eager to please. This unexpected contrast between the princess's lofty title and her ingratiating attitude make you smile. The room is rather scanty, yes, when it comes to its contents, but it is more than passable. It has a roof and four walls. And though it is cold, you fancy you will feel warmer once you have slipped beneath the bed sheets. The room is not quite so fancy as your dormitory at the conservatory. I... Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. And neither is it so large. But it does have one glaring improvement over your previous lodgings. You will not be expected to share it with anybody else. There is only one bed in this room, and this bed belongs to you. You think that the peace and quiet will do you a world of good. You tell the princess as much, and she smiles. That's good. I was worried you wouldn't like it. <laughs> I know it isn't much to look at, but it's one of the nicest servants' rooms we have in the castle. Most of the maids sleep beneath the roof in this teensy tiny room, which is all cramped. There's tens of beds up there, and they're so close together, but they're not really needed anymore because everyone's dead or gone. There's barely any room up there to pass between them. That sounds like chickens in a fucking chicken coop. I thought it was perfectly ghastly when I saw it the last time I went up there. Not that I was supposed to be up there. It was a rainy day and I couldn't go outdoors, so I was doing a bit of exploring. If the housekeeper had known I'd been skulking around, I don't think she would have been best pleased. Well, in any case, nobody sleeps up there anymore. The scullery maids are all gone now. I couldn't put you up there. Though, in the attic, with all those empty beds, I didn't think it'd be very cheery. No, that'd actually be really fucking, like, creepy and depressing. You're not just a scullery maid, you're my lady's maid. Which means, you deserve good lodgings. It'd be an insult to offer you any less than this. Well, I appreciate that, thank you. Now, it's getting late. You'll have to forgive me for rabbiting on. I've heard it sometimes... I, I've heard it's something I tend to do. It's a bad habit. I don't mind it. One that's unbecoming for a lady. Again, I don't mind. I mean, as long as you're not rude or mean, then, yeah, I don't mind. The housekeeper warned me enough times. You reassure the princess to the contrary, smiling as you do. You do not mind if she talks too much, that it is better than not talking at all. Her affable nature makes it easier to spend time with her. Manners be damned. <coughs> I'll say this. <coughs> I do. I do like it when people are affable, especially when they're polite and courteous and are of a very decorous nature. And again, decorum. I'm not saying decorous like decorations or like ostentatious. I mean, basically, someone who is a very... Adequate isn't the right word. It's kind of like how the word Zenzucht is a German word that means extreme longing, but there's no really appropriate equivalent definition of that in English. And honestly, I feel the definitions that I can offer you really don't do it justice, not, not to the degree that I think of it. But to make it very simple, good-mannered, humble, polite, modest, kind,
one could see it as being ladylike or gentlemanly. Granted, I'm not a formal, stuck-up person, but I do believe in behaving with proper respect and courtesy toward people. Another good way to put it is be wholesome to wholesome people and to those that tell you to fuck off, tell them to fuck off as well. Treat people with the level of respect they treat you with. But in general, I feel the basic default is everyone should treat each other with great civility and kindness and respect with proper manners. And like, while I am the, the sense that everyone, like, clothing is unisex. You can wear whatever you want as long as you like how you look in it. But there are times and places with certain clothing. Not based on anything other than just being respectful. For example, I certainly would be not opposed to wearing baggy black jeans with some chains and a, like a corn t-shirt or shit like that. But I certainly would never wear that in church. Not that there's any sin with wearing such clothes. It's more so that I just want to be respectful of God. After all, I'm not there to show off. I'm not there to look good. I'm there for God. It's not about wearing some fancy suit or about wearing whatever I feel personally comfortable or feel I look good in. It's about simply wearing modest, humble clothes. You're not there to be arrogant or be the center of attention. You're there to simply read the word and be reverent toward God. And grandly, you'll listen to what the preacher or pastor has to say. But you can feel free to disagree with them, as long as you're polite and cordial, in my opinion. And if they have no interest in that, then simply pursue God on your own terms. Read the Bible on your own. Heck, I'm a strong proponent of that even if you're an atheist, that you should read the Bible. Then again, that largely comes from a stance of, I'm someone who really likes reading. I, for example, I'll read Greek mythology. I don't believe in Greek gods or anything, but I find reading... Well, I mean, I'm a person with so many light novels and mangas and books of Shakespeare and shit. I like reading. And I'll say this, visual novels are nice too. There's a degree of interaction. But most of all, you have beautiful art, like this. And people would certainly say that this is not the most impressive thing they've seen. And I'd say, yes, there's certainly art out there that's more three-dimensional or has many more layers to it. But I'll say this. I like... Grand, there's many aesthetics I do like. But I do like the picture I see. I like the drawing I see. And I feel... Very strongly that... The artist who... Drew the characters... At least of the one character I have seen... That I think they're very good at what they do. And I like... Their skill. And I feel it is noticeable that I feel that... Looking at it, that not only are they skillful, but they put a lot of hard work into this. Not just in planning, but also in just drawing itself. I enjoy stories, but some good sound effects, voice acting, interaction. But I would say, most of all, the pictures and the music. Heck. Horrific Xanatorium. A game I would strongly recommend. I only took three parts to play through the visual novel, though. And I do tend to jump around from game to game to game. If I ever do leave a game on the back burner, let me know, and I'm, I'll at least consider more 
eagerly coming back to it. But I like art. I like music. I like voice acting. And I like good stories. And so far, although I expect this story to potentially become a bit of a horror novel after a bit, and potentially gory? And I don't know how I'm going to feel about the story when I get to that point. I guess it all depends on how well the story is written and how everything is. I, After all, I mean, I don't know what to expect, so I really can't tell you if I'm going to like where the story goes. And the fact that it's multiple paths and choices matter, so it might require multiple playthroughs. But I'll say this, so far, I am greatly enjoying this story. You were always scolded too, back in your... Again, I don't have to say that. Conserva... Wouldn't be Tori. Twar? Twary? I, I don't know. Because Tori would be T-O-R-Y, but here we have a T-O-I-R-E. From your behavior. You know full well how aggravating it be to be upbraided. Not for any particular misdemeanor, but for being yourself. Well, I'm glad you understand, the princess answers with a giggle. I really should be off, though. It's bad manners to keep you up, especially when you look so sleepy. Get some rest. We can talk tomorrow if you don't mind my ceaseless prattle. No, I actually like it. Like I said, as long as you're polite and, you know, you come with an intention. Because it's, it's not so much what you say, so much as intention. I mean, you're being friendly and you're being courteous and respectful to me. I mean, as long as you're not being condescending or threatening. Or mean. Glad you seem to appreciate it, at least. Though I'm sure you'll get tired of it eventually. All of my old maids did, hee <laughs> hee. This princess departs, and in her absence you take a seat upon your bed, your new bed. You cannot help but think this is all happening very quickly. It does not seem like very long that you were still in the forest, running for your life amongst the tall, imposing trees with their gnarled, grasping branches. The forest might as well have been a distant memory now, though. You are indoors, inside a castle, no less, and you have been given a room in which to sleep in clothes that you might wear. It seems premature still to declare that you are out of the woods, in a metaphorical sense. I mean, but things could certainly be worse. You force yourself to stand on legs which feel too weary to support you and change into the night clothes hanging in the wardrobe. The night clothes do not fit you properly, but you are too tired to care about that. You are too tired to care about much of anything. You retreat to the bed and slide beneath its sheets. Then you let your eyelids fall as shut. You exhale. And lulled by the breeze which blows outdoors, you fall asleep. You are so very tired, your sleep is a deep, dark one. Darker even than the fervous abysses of the nighttime. <coughs> like the nighttime sky, however, which shimmers with the stars, your sleep is not devoid of those prismatic fragments you humans call dreams. Though in this case, I'd rather think your nocturnal imaginings are worth rather more than that. They are not dreams, uh, are they? To which your slumbering mind is subjected, you know that they are not. Otherwise your bodily would not be so very cold, not so clammy. The images that flicker beneath your closed eyes, like the ghostly images in a... I don't think I've ever seen that word before in my life. Phenicostope? I don't know what that word means. I've seen kaleidoscope before, and telescope, and microscope, and periscope, and I know what those mean. I have never seen this word before, and I don't know what it means.
were not conjured from within your mind. They were instead taken from your memories. You are not merely dreaming. You are remembering. You remember the girls who slept in your dormitory, and how they always hastened to use the shower first, so you were last for breakfast. You remember how you finally did arrive at the dining hall. The most desirable morsels had already been snaffled up by the girls who got there earlier. You struggled, too, to find a seat once you finally did get your hands on some food, because nobody ever wanted to sit with you. The other girls all acted like you were a leper, save for when they wanted favors. They never asked for these favors, mind you, for why would they? To them, your father's prestige did not matter. They were all wealthy ladies, too, many of them wealthier than you. When everybody has the airs and graces of a princess, how is anybody supposed to stand out? You stood out the least in your class, perhaps because you were one of the smallest, the frailest, the sickliest, who always came down with colds in the winter. Your poor health did not stop the other girls from treating you as a servant, though, when they remembered that you existed, of course. It is your lot in life as you dwelt within the stone walls of the word you cannot know how to pronounce to carry school bags across the field like a pack mule. Then come the evenings, the girls in your dormitory had you sewing on missing buttons and ironing out the creases and wrinkles in their uniforms. If there was an odd job that needed performing, you would always be asked, but these girls did not ask you. That would have been too civilized. They ordered you instead, and as they ordered you, they laughed at you. They laughed and they laughed and they laughed. The laughter hurt, but it hurt considerably less than the kicks did and the slaps and the pinches. Once, during an embroidery lesson, one of your classmates had an accident with her sewing scissors. She stumbled, or at least she pretended to, and before you knew it, the silvery blades of the scissors were embedded in your left palm. This happened quite some time ago, when you were even littler than you are now. But you can still remember it. It hurt a lot. The scissors were sharp and they perforated your skin. Not all the way down to the bone, but enough to bleed. Your wound bled bright red like strawberry jam all over your embroidery. Then, when your professor saw it, she shrieked. Her face turned as pale as whey, and she looked for a few moments as though she might faint though you were the one who was in pain. Your professor looked at your face. She could not bear to look at your hand, then demanded to know why you could not be more careful. Her tone had been an accusatory one, almost as if you had stabbed yourself in the hand with your scissors to goad her. The pain in your hand hurt, but the giggles of your persecutors hurt all the more. They never were punished for that. Why does this feel fucking relatable? Perhaps your professor did not care enough to punish them. Perhaps she, like everyone else, thought it was all your fault. I mean, there literally were times I had teachers yell at me for other people bullying me. The wound, when all was said and done, was not too deep. You did not even need any stitches. It healed well enough in time on its own, though it still left a scar, a white raised thing like a crescent moon. You still have that scar. You do not know how much blood you lost. It seemed like a lot. Back in the classroom, you could smell it in the air, sharp as iron. But it could not have been that much, evidently. If your wound had been more serious, perhaps your professor might have cared. Perhaps your classmates, too, would have felt some modicum of guilt over what they did. I have literally had people attack me and had a hundred people fucking laugh at me. I've literally had people either stranglehold me, hop my back full Nelson me. Granted, this is early school stuff, like fifth and sixth grade shit, but hell, I've had people put a rope around my neck and fucking choke me and all that shit or jump my back. And I'm just saying a lot of people treat me like shit and nobody else fucking cared. Actually, they fucking enjoyed it. So yay for childhood of everyone fucking hates you and wants you to die and tells you every day that you should kill yourself in horrible, hundreds of horrible, horrible insults every single day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And granted, yes, that's shit that's like, you know, between 20 and 30 years ago at this point, given I'm 37. But, you know, between... 
the long-lasting effects of that and the just general amount of I don't remember what a fucking hug feels like, aside from the minimal amount of hugs I might eventually, from time to time, give my son or my mother. Let's just say... It does make a lot of sense I talk to stuffed animals. Then again, I've done that my whole life since my earliest memories. What can I say? I guess I must be a, a overly emotionally needy person who has never really felt like I've had enough, which I really can't blame certain people for. I just am different. That's just how I am, and that's just who I am. And to a degree, I would say it's also a genetic thing, because even though my son has never seen or heard of me doing, you know, talking to stuffed animals in such a way, he does it in the exact same way I did it when I was a child. So, I assume maybe there's a potential genetic factor there, too. Hmm. But yeah, people were assholes, but it is what it is. It's the distant past. It's like 20 lifetimes ago. But this seems very unlikely. You know that your blood meant nothing to your classmates who all wanted you to die and at times tried to murder you. And and people tried to actually stab you, or gouge out your eyes, or wanted to cut off your arms, or strangled you, or ran up behind you and kicked you in the back of the knees, while over a hundred people fucking laughed at you. Crack, that one time you had fucking Bell's Palsy, and people came and started kicking you in the nuts, and punching you in the face, and jabbing you in the fucking eyes, even though you literally had palsy, and looked like you had a fucking stroke for two weeks. Everyone's like, get the fuck over it, this stuff happened forever, but I'm like... It, it, it still is an issue, especially given lack of current positive things. Because that's the thing, usually you'd probably ignore stuff of the distant past if you had enough positive present things, but like I said, I don't remember what a hug feels like. So, yay for depression and loneliness. Why should it? If you met next to nothing, then the blood in your veins was, if such a thing is possible, even more inconsequential. Ha! I even made a video talking about that stuff. I literally titled it Inconsequential. That was literally the name of the video. As a gift of a blonde-haired anime boy, which is supposed to represent me. You feel disoriented when you wake, at long last with the rising of the sun. You do not remember why what you dreamt, but you do not think that your dreams were a particularly pleasant nature. If they were, your heart would not be hammering, so I too have lots of nightmares. And very unusual, very vivid dreams. Ill at ease, you glance around. You are lying in a narrow bed in an unremarkable room, one with dull beige walls and a warped wooden floor. Where exactly are you? This does not look like your dormitory in the cubs, so not less it has shrunk threefold overnight. Your brow furrows as you attempt to recall the events of the night prior. Until with a gasp, it all clicks into place. You remember now. You were running through the woods, trying to escape from... You shudder. You do not want to think about what it was you were trying to escape from. <coughs> you presume that you must have given your hunter the slip, though. Because you are still in one piece, awake and alert to face the dawning of a new morning. You still have all of your limbs, and all your facial features appear to be in the correct configuration. That is more than enough to be getting along with. You look to the foot of your bed, then blink, bemused at your discovery. You can see, lying upon the sheets, a garment, two garments actually, of black and white folded into a neat white square. So it's a maid's outfit. That being said, I guess... The princess is a lighter sleeper than me? I mean, it's not like she has a digital alarm clock, but... Then again, I mean, she could have an actual, like, grandfather clock. 
that goes off at a certain time. Or, you know, the ministers woke up. Who knows? What could that be? A maid's outfit? If so, it would not be too surprising. You can now recall your visit with the princess the night prior, and her assertions that you must be her lady's maid. Well, if that is the role she wants you to assume, you have no qualms with it. <coughs> it is far preferable to be the other role you played last night, that of a startled quarry running from its pursuer. You press your fingers against the humble maid's attire. It feels surprisingly soft to the touch, not coarse like you expected. Oh, it's made of silk? That's really cool. These clothes are rather fine. Did the princess put them here? If so, that is all the more reason to wear them. You are not a churlish enough to deny her hospitality. You rise from your new bed, then undress yourself, unbuttoning the front of your plain white nightgown. And sitting it aside, this task accomplished, you then clad yourself in your new attire, black, white, and eminently sensible. You feel very far away from the girl that you once were. You guys remember that anime, Eminence in the Shadows? Or Holy Land? It's a pretty good manga. It's like Hajime no Ippo. Hi, there's a manga called The Strongest Brave Who Craves Revenge, which makes a redo of a healer look PG-13. Your face, it has a guy named Raoul Evans in it. Your face might be the same as always, but something within you seems to have changed. You are no longer a student, not as long as you mean to reside within the princess's castle. You would far rather be her servant. Assured of your newfound identity, you retreat from your chamber, then make your way to your mistress's bedroom. The castle is a large one of many, many rooms, and many, many hallways to connect them, and for a brief while you find yourself horrendously lost. You cannot remember where the princess's bedroom is. You are beginning to feel rather disoriented when, to your relief, your eyes snag upon a stairwell which looks rather familiar. Could this be the way? You ascend these steps, your footfalls cushioned by the plush carpet which lines them. Then, find your way down the very same hall you traversed the night prior. If your memory does not fail you, then the princess's bedroom ought to be. Yes, it is here. You rap upon the door, but receive nothing in the way of a response. Is the princess still abed? You wonder briefly whether you ought to wait until she has risen of her own accord, but no. The sun is high in the sky, and it would seem a shame to let the princess sleep through the day. You ought, instead, to rouse her. That seems like the sort of duty a lady's maid should attend to. You enter the princess's bedroom and glance about. Her room looks much like same as you remember from the night prior, though the ceiling seems even higher when viewed in the warm, the wane morning light. I will say this, in terms of the way this, the main character speaks or thinks, and in terms of the fact that, yes, I tend to err on the side of politeness and a very timorous nature. I am a person who is timorous and tends to be very polite and very courteous and very... I'm not formal, but I, be I behave with decorum. Basically, politeness, humility, kindness, respect. I'm not somebody given to being arrogant or abrasive. If anything, people like... I'm the opposite of insufferable. Which I know that sounds very unbelievable given the fact that how much I fucking ramble on in these videos. But IRL, I really don't talk even 1% of this much. And I usually don't talk about anything personal. I usually don't have much of anyone to talk to. And even then, if I did have people to talk to, I wouldn't talk to them like I am right now. Because I wouldn't want to annoy the shit out of them. And if I did, it would usually be either one, they specifically told me it was okay to talk like this or I'm just emotionally overwhelmed but I tend to be a person who is honestly people tend to criticize me as that I tend to be too polite I tend to be too accommodating and agreeable with people not that I'm trying to be a people pleaser so much so as I just feel a very strong sense of being respectful to people. It's something that's just part of me as a person. I've always done it 
for as long as I can remember. Heck, I'll tend to do a little bit of a nod slash bow to people at all times. And I can't help that. I mean, there's a lot of time I strained my neck once from some sort of injury or something, and I was still doing it even though it physically hurt to me to do that. I will nod at people in phone calls, and I mean back before like face chat stuff. And people can't see it. I will nod at a letter I'm reading. I, I will nod towards fucking like animals on a bike trail as if like I'm you know, treating them with courtesy as if I'm talking to a person and treating that person with respect. Now, of course, you have to be able to adapt to different situations and environments you're in. But my default is I'm a very respectful, non-confrontational person. And I tend to be very kind and gentle and very empathetic. That's just my default about basically in general when I'm around people I tend to be the opposite of insufferable. Though many people would also view me as either cowardly or boring. But I tend to be very polite and friendly with people. It's just there's many situations where I'm, you know, maybe forced into an environment that is requiring me to act out of my own nature and adapt to just either fit in or just not die. You know, survival's usually pretty important in some situations. Or just, you know, not stand out. But yeah, my default nature is I'm somebody who usually doesn't talk very much and tends to be friendly and kind and quiet and reserved and... tends to be very... Like I said, I'm not formal. I'm not some uppity, like, royal person. Heck, I'm not rich. I'm not formal. I just behave in a manner that I consider decent and with dignity and with just propriety. Aside of that, emotions, I tend to really not talk about personal things or tend to st- cause any sort of arguments or, well, in general, I tend to not talk too much at all. Like I said, in this video alone, I've probably talked more than I have to another human being over the course of the entire year. And I'll say in general, I'm much more open with emotions and feelings, or even allowing myself to cry sometimes with this than I ever would around a person. Heck, there's many times I would probably like spend usually about every single day probably laying in bed listening to nightcore music and crying to the point that my face is drenched in tears pretty much on a daily basis. But I don't cry in front of other people or really express those kinds of emotions So much so that many, many people IRL honestly think I'm like a fucking robot. They think I don't even have emotions or feelings. They don't even think I'm capable of crying. So, (laughs) that's funny, isn't it? (laughs) 
You can see now that there are fewer shadows to impede your view. How very opulent of the young mistress's abode is. Her armoire is large and imposing, as is the grate in which you will be expected to keep a fire lit during the nights. The princess herself, meanwhile, is curled on her side beneath the sheets, looking rather less grandiose than her title would suggest. She is attired in nightgown, adorned with frills, and her hair is split across her pillow like a spilled gold. In her slender arms, meanwhile, held to her chest is a doll, the very same one in which she was cosseting last night. You suppose this doll must be her favorite. Idly, you wonder what the doll's name is. Though you do not suppose it matters all that much, it is time to wake your mistress. You call out to the princess, but she is largely unresponsive. Her eyelashes are still sewn tightly shut and her lips pursed in slumber. You purse your lips too and sigh. Well, nobody ever said your job would be easy. Once again, you call the princess, and this time she replies. Her response is not a favorable one, however. In, in. She sighs and turns away from you, her doll clutched to her chest. Just give me a little longer. The princess sounds so enfeebled, but you do not take pity on her. If you have learnt anything from your concert, save for knowledge pertaining to the respiratory of tracts of fish, it is that one must be cruel to be kind. You do not think this age was practiced with any great success in the conserve, but perhaps it will be more of impact upon the princess. You tell her once again to wake up more sternly this time. You will not let her sleep, for she has slept long enough already. It is very slovenly, really, to still be abed at such an hour. Oh, defeated the princess side. All right, I can see that I can't twist you around my little finger. I'm up, I'm up. You don't need to nag me. Once you have roused the princess from her bed, and you have put her doll to one side, you set upon her toilet. I feel like the way I pronounce that, is that it's supposed to be like a, a fluffy pillow thing. You aid the princess in brushing over her hair, a chore to which she submits willingly, like a cat might allow its fur to be brushed. You allow yourself to ponder, as you run the bristles of the princess's brush through her hair, how wonderfully soft it feels against your skin. But a curious query from the princess, are you all right, dear one, brings you back to your senses. You were rather lost in thought there. Look lively now. You wouldn't want the princess to catch wind of your salacious thoughts, would you? I thought that you had learnt your lesson about that already. Suitably chastened, you finished with the princess's hair, then set the brush aside. Now that the princess's tresses have been taken care of, you must start on her attire. The princess remains seated upon the edge of her bed, looking up at you uh, askance. Askance? She does not ask you to avert her eyes, nor does she make any motion of divesting herself of her nightgown. She really does seem as though she expects you to undertake this task on your own. Is that all right? You ask the princess as much. You would not wish to impinge upon her modesty, but she only laughs. Yes, that's all right. It's what you're supposed to do if you're to be my lady's maid. I'm used to be dressed and undressed. I'm not a bit squeamish about it. She might not be squeamish about it, but you are. You have never seen a naked woman before accepting yourself. Even then, however, you have always dressed and undressed furtively, not wanting to examine your body for longer than is strictly necessary. You have never much liked the way you look. You make a few more mumbled objections, but the princess sweeps them aside to one side easily. It's all right. I might be a princess, but we are both people underneath all of our clothes. I doubt we look much different. You are not sure about that. You have not yet seen the princess unadorned, but you already know to look at her face that you are different. She is much, much prettier than you are. But she is waiting, and you do not wish to keep her any longer. You steady your nerves.